So welcome to episode six of Art and Activism, uh, Art as Strategy with Aviva Ramani. In this web series, we will discuss ways that artists actively engage in creating climate solutions and promoting sustainability. We at WEED believe that art can be a powerful tool for raising awareness and prompting social change. In this web series, we are looking at ways that artists are actively engaged in creating climate solutions and promoting sustainability. Uh, we will have questions after the presentation. Please put questions you have in the chat and I will have Aviva address them after the presentation. And now I'm gonna have Christina Bertera talk about some opportunities for artists. Yes, we're really excited at Weed because we have a couple of shows coming up in the fall uh, that we would like you to know about. They're called Art on the Edge from Extraction to Restoration and Regeneration, part one and part two. So there are two shows. Uh, the deadline for the first one is on June 1st and the second one on July 1st. So we really encourage you to consider applying. You can go to our website, which is weedartists.org. And there's a clickable button there. Uh, and that will lead you to everythingy, which we're learning to uh, use for managing applications. Uh, you, you just register when you get to everythingy, or excuse me, entry thingy. And then you can uh, fill out your application and submit your images, et cetera. So um, there's no application fee, but you will have to become a WEED member or make sure your dues are current if you are accepted into the shows. So please tell people you know about it if they do work that's relevant to themes of extraction, restoration, and regeneration. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Christina. So episode six, of art and activism, art as strategy with Aviva Ramani. So Dr. Aviva Ramani is a eco artist, is a founding member of, member of the Eco Art Dialogue and co-editor of Eco Art in Action, coming out this fall with New Village Press. She just completed her work memoir, Divining, Divining Chaos, the Autobiography and of an Idea, coming out next June also with the New Village Press. She recently initiated Science Art Net Zero with the U.S. Department of Cultural Affairs and the State Department. The Blue Trees and the Blue Trees Symphony to 2015 to present have in, been installed and copyrighted in the path of natural gas pipelines to protect forests across miles of North America, gaining international attention and support, including several fellowships. Dr. Romani holds a PhD from Plymouth University UK in environmental sciences, technology, and studio art. The work Trigger Points, Tipping Points premiered at the 2007 Venice Biennale. She is an affiliate at the Institute for Arctic and Alpine Research at the University of Colorado and currently working on fire modeling in collaboration with Olivia Haas for Arts Cabinet UK. Please welcome Aviva Romani. Thank you so much, Kate. I am so thrilled to be here with everybody. And thank you so much for inviting me. I want to thank Manoush and uh, Christina and Kate and Susan Steinman, of course. I just wanna say before we start, how important I think what you're doing is. One of the issues that I think so many of us face as women is that we are silenced or we are ignored or we are gaslit and it makes it really hard for us to bring our ideas forth. This is a platform to change that. And it's, it's just, it can't be underestimated how important I think it is. And I believe it is for all of us. So I'm going to go straight into my share screen and it still is indicating that uh, I'm sharing sound. So that's a good thing. And we're going to go to the uh, home. Give me a minute here. Um, can you see my screen yet? Yes. 
can see it. Can you make it full screen? I'm just about to do that. Uh, slideshow. All righty. So um, I want you to think about how art is made a little bit differently than assembling things uh, or even perhaps ideas. So you might consider the idea that we create maps when we deal with any kind of system for how things relate to each other. That is like a score, a score in the sense of this is how you go forward in time and it's complicated, but it's also a strategy. So I'm going to concentrate on two major works of mine, one out of which I developed trigger point theory, which is ghost nets. And the other was the Blue Tree Symphony, which was the application of those ideas. So my task in ghost nets from 1990 to 2000 were three primary goals. One was water access and purity, establishing contiguity in large biogeographies and the echo tones between habitats. So you're gonna hear some language here that may not be obvious. I hope that we'll get into them in more detail in uh, the Q&A, but just to rephrase what I have here, we need water, the different elements of what creates biology, such as a forest system or an ocean, they need to be connected to each other. You can't have them in little bits and pieces here and there. And ecotones are the parts of habitats that connect the external aspect of the system to the next system. This is vastly oversimplified. So in the normal art world, what we do is we have a variety of forms that we work with painting, installation, sonification, visualization, storytelling, writings, workshops, performances, Zooms, public art, engineering, political actions, demonstrations, legal initiatives, and just conversations such as we're having here. But the part that interests me most is the idea that we might create a new knowledge space. So what we're creating is not an assemblage of stuff. We might be creating a place out of which we can behave differently. So in, a, in essence, that is trigger point theory. And there are six rules for applying trigger point theory to any complicated problem. And I'm going to state them briefly now and we'll come back to them over and over again in this talk. There will be a small point of entry into any chaotic system. <clears throat> the paradox of urgency is that there is time to change. Layering information will test perception. Metaphors are idea models. There will be critical disruptions in sensitive initial conditions and play will teach. And half these rules are derived from physics about how things actually change. So we'll start with the first rule that there will be a small point of entry into any chaotic system, which is essentially how chaos theory works. And I should reiterate about chaos theory that events in the actual world, in the real world don't happen in a linear fashion. They occur within relationship to each other. That is the essence of complexity theory and chaos theory is that within those relationships, there are sensitive points where everything can change and is constantly adapting. And, and I know these are complicated ideas, so I do hope that we'll come back to them. So the first thing I did in the ghost nets project was I created a medicine wheel opportunity. I had a Cherokee elder come up and he basically blessed the land with a medicine wheel. And so that was the very first thing that we did to start healing the uh, property. 
And in the background, what you see here is the rocks after the fire was burned off in the medicine wheel. And what you see in the insert is what some of that same land looked like um, several years later. And I'm just going to play you a little bit of a walk through that land. So what I did while I created ghost nets was every day I did a one hour walk traversing the entire site. And that was how I was able to study all the microclimates and the microhabitats and figure out how to uh, maximize water retention and um, and the biodiversity within the habitats. You'll see in a moment that what we started from was nothing. So this is after some work. So I took this idea of starting with a very small point and seeing how it might affect a large system and worked with Jim White on trigger points, tipping points for, this was for the uh, weather report show at the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art that Lucy Lepard curated. But we were also looking at sites all over the world specifically to study deltaic systems and where climate change was happening at the same time as major demographic conflicts. So when we did a film about this, that's what was first shown at uh, the Venice Biennale in 2007. But we looked at uh, New Orleans and uh, what had happened or what was going to happen uh, with the storms there. We looked at Bangladesh. Uh, it's hard to tell from this image here, but all this blue that just looks like ocean is basically where Bangladesh is going to be in 2030. It's going to be inundated with water. And then of course, these images down here are the Arctic and the process of melting. One of the, uh, areas that I was really interested in was what's happening in the Middle East and in Egypt. And you can't read this uh, text because it's too small, but what it says is coming attractions, resource wars. And there's a lot of evidence that a good deal of the conflict we're seeing in the Middle East now and has been developing is related to climate change and fighting for resources. Uh, and this is just a detail of New Orleans and how we uh, perceived the chaos of the habitat in the Gulf of Mexico and how bad it might get by 2040. So uh, out of that collaboration and continuing to work on uh, the idea of a small point uh, to intervene in chaotic systems, we had a chance to work on a project in Memphis that was called Fish Story. And what happened was we started working with uh, Eugene Turner, who is the scientist who's been monitoring the BP spill ever since it happened. And when we first started to work together, I asked him, okay, if we were going to mitigate some of the damage to the Gulf of Mexico, where would he start? And he said, Ohio, because that's where we're getting all the runoff from agriculture and Memphis is kind of between Ohio and um, the Gulf of Mexico. And one of the things that came out of the process of developing that installation, and here's a, a detail of it, uh, the silver is the tributaries of the Mississippi River, was that we calculated that if we could uh, increase forestation by 2030, we could mitigate climate change. And there have been a number of studies that have come out since our work, which was in 2013, to the effect that that would be true. So my point here is that 
in working between art and science, we could come up with questions and answers that were ahead of the curve. So this is a, a quick quote from my book. Um, whoops, sorry. I'm trying to minimize some of you so that I can see my screen. There will be a black swan of a surprising event at a small point of entry into chaos. I have argued that by considering relationships through the lens of art, that point of entry can always be found. So the next rule is that the paradox of urgency is that there is time to change. We never feel like there is time, but there is time. When I started with the Ghost Nets project, this is pretty much this gray area, what the site looked like. It was made land for the schooners to bring granite down to the east, down the east coast. And uh, it was pretty barren and it had become a dump site. The insert that you see here is a detail of the uh, wetlands area that had been restored in 2007. So I took that premise a little further and we did the Blue Rocks project, which again took a very degraded site, a causeway that had been narrowed. And when it was restored with an investment of um, a little over 500,000 from the USDA, we had about 30 acres of very productive wetlands. And what interested me in this area was that it wasn't just that 30 acres of wetlands were productive, but it was at a keystone area in the whole Gulf of Maine. So it affected way more than just those 30 acres. And that was an example of developing the contiguity. And this is a, just a few years after that. So the next rule is layering information will test your perception, any perception, especially confirmation bias. So in my dissertation, one of the issues I looked at was that there are invasive European green crabs that are basically decimating both the eelgrass, which is the uh, aquatic forest that a lot of life depends upon throughout the world, but specifically the Gulf of Maine, and they were decimating all the fin fish. And what I was trying to find out was in the areas where you still have a lot of eelgrass, would it be possible that the fin fish might survive longer than they have been? And the uh, results, I have to say, were inconclusive. But this is a much more detailed rendering of the geographic information systems analysis that we did. And the question was, could environmental trees store fin fish in the Gulf of Maine? In the ghost net site, over and over again, what I tried to do was keep snags, dead trees, and the plants that I uh, created or established in the gardens uh, so that they could interact and I could enjoy the garden, but the garden would uh, be, the, be hospitable to other life. In this installation, this is just a detail, what I did with Urban Novak is, was we calculated if we could uh, connect all the open space in this small part of the city of Portland, how might it connect to larger aquatic systems that are continental? And the conclusion was that we could. Um, so then we get to the next rule, which is that metaphors are idea models. Uh, so the metaphor that I took in ghost nets was the bed of nets, which you're seeing here. And what you're looking at is the drift nets. And these are the nets that get loose from the boats. And when they get loose, they continue to strip mine the ocean of marine life, birds, uh, dolls. as a metaphor for ghost nets project that kill us the way marine life is being killed. They are 
indestructible. The fish swim in, they are trapped on their gills and they die a horrible death. And I put it on a bed because it seems to me that very often that happens in bed. Okay, well, it's really interesting, I think. Um, in chaos theory, you have the idea that um, a butterfly can flap its wings and it's going to cause a storm in, in Japan or where. Um, the implication is that if we look at any complication, the subtle relationships in in how things interact with each other are the clues we need to look at, not the big stuff, the little stuff. So this was a detail from when we restored the GhostNet site. We took out a good deal of the riprap that had been uh, dumped into the estuary to make the made land. And what you're looking at is actually uh, a combination of the highest known storm surge line in 1994 and the first time that fresh water met salt water in 100 years. This is what the site looked like when I first bought it. I bought the town dump and then I started moving rocks around, big boulders and small rocks to see how I could um, choreograph the way the water came down the hill and reduce erosion. And this is that same small part of the site a few years afterwards. And just about everything that I've planted here is uh, animal friendly. It provides forage or it keeps me happy with fragrances. Um, it supports bees and so on. So here's the problem. It's really hard work. And now I'm going to read you another small excerpt from the book. Without fairy tales like Pollyanna optimism, this practice or this it takes the sort of determined courage Joan of Arc epitomized as part of a I gave this year for, a gra for graduate students at the University of Wisconsin, I identified eight qualities that might make for a successful echo art practice. Research, modeling, specifically the development of complex adaptive models, which are ways of applying uh, algorithms to understanding the relationships between, model, uh, between agents in any system. Illustration and documentation as artifacts in themselves, formal and technical competence, persistence, political diplomacy, which is not my strong suit, I must say, uh, interdisciplinary ease, and above all, courage. So in this 2005 installation in Exit Art, at Exit Art, uh, New York City, what I looked at, and this was before Sandy, was how might we take indigenous plants, pull up the damn pavement, plant the plants, and how that might mitigate flooding. And so I proposed it for 10th Avenue. Um, nobody bought the plants. I was very disappointed. Um, but I brought them back to Maine and I planted them in my garden. So here we are again with these rules, and I'm going to repeat them because I think they're important. There will be a small point of entry into any chaotic system. The paradox of urgency is that there is time to change. Layering information will test perception. Metaphors are our DM models. There will be critical disruptions in sensitive initial conditions and play will teach. So now we're gonna move on to the Blue Trees Symphony and I'm going to try to illustrate how what I learned from the Ghost Nets project was applied to the Blue Tree Symphony to try to engage in the legal system. So there were three tasks that I had. One was I had to establish my standing in the discourse in art history. 
I couldn't go into the courtroom and say, ah, this is good work, protect it. No, I had to prove that other people were looking at the work and it was important in their own conversations uh, within the context of art history. Two, I had to establish permanence in the environment. A garden doesn't do it. A garden is ephemeral. Uh, art that is activist does not do it because it does not have a permanent impact on the environment. So what I had to prove was that the design for the Blue Tree Symphony was going to be there for at least as long as the trees could live. And finally, I had to prove my intention in the culture. It was not appropriate for me to argue that ecocide is bad and art is good. I had to prove that my intention from the very beginning was to make good art. So there will be a small point of entry into a chaotic system. In this installation in South Korea, in uh, Daejeon, at the Crick Gallery, what I did was I took a, or created a collage of all the points where we would see maximum sea level rise and posited a, a series of hypothetical points where we could preserve habitat. So people came into the space, they walked through these branches, these are quince branches, which were painted with a, the casein of ultramarine blue that I've been using. And they heard bird song from some of the, uh, one of the locations where I had been painting trees. Um, and this is experiential, it's about awareness. This is just a detail of some of that work. So the paradox of urgency is that there is time to change. And this is the big problem that assembling a legal case takes a lot of time and a lot of people. Um, restoring a habitat takes a lot of time. Changing the way people think takes a lot of time. And somehow you have to contain or I have to contain my sense of urgency while you do that process of laying one brick on top of the other. Um, when I did the overture for the Blue Tree Symphony, we tried to get a cease and desist order for an injunction against the gas lines. We failed in Peekskill, New York. And when I went to see what the corporations had done to the site, I was completely devastated. But at that point, I realized that's the beginning of the story. The devastation was where the story had to start. So again, layering information will affect perception. So what I did in, um, and I have to close this there. Um, what I did to copyright and protect the work we were doing was I created this symphony in which these trees represent notes. They were, um, they constituted a melodic line. They were mapped with GIS. So it's not just generally saying, oh, there's a bunch of trees that I painted, but specific places that correlated to the sound that I was trying to create. So I'm just gonna play you a little bit of how that sound developed on a continental scale.
hundreds of trees were painted. Each time a tree was painted, it represented a note or a chord. And if we looked down on all those GPS locations, because they <coughs> recapitulated the uh, score that had been designed for the project as an iterative melody, they could be performed. And so these were details of what those tree notes looked like after they had been painted. Um, one of the aspects of this project that completely fascinated me was just what it looked like to put paint on the bark of a tree. And now I need to remind you that this is a casein with buttermilk and uh, ultramarine blue, so it's non-toxic. It was actually friendly to critters. In another project, it attracted uh, a whole bunch of finches who loved the buttermilk. And um, it was beautiful. It was beautiful to see that translucent blue over nature and then to think about all the acoustic life that was created by, cre by um, putting that additional layer on the trees. In uh, 2017 or 20, no, yeah, 2017, I did a presentation in Beijing and in, in China. And after that, I detoured to Inner Mongolia. I've always been completely fascinated by the horse tribes there. And what was so impactful about the days that I spent there, and I didn't have very much time, but I did ride a horse with no name through the desert. Uh, what was so impactful was to see exactly how that landscape was being devastated by the same drivers. In this case, it's the search for precious minerals uh, that are devastating sites all over the world. So it's all connected. Uh, this is from a, sh a show that they put on that was really amazing with the horses. Um, so here's a whole culture that is being lost to basically corporate or governmental greed. So now we go back to this rule of metaphors are idea models. So just so you can visualize a little bit of how this whole idea works. Each of these tree icons represents sites where um, the Blue Tree Symphony was uh, installed, basically. Um, imagine them as being placed on musical lines. You can see how I got from the idea of tree notes to creating a whole symphony. And this is a fanciful Photoshop version of some of the score superimposed over uh, images of some of the painted trees. In this case, the trees were the uh, base chords for the symphony. Um, each of the symphony was a measure and in the whole uh, composition, and so there were uh, treble and bass notes. This was a series of bass notes in the symphony. And this is a detail from an installation this past year where I took branches. These are each about 60 feet long. They were again painted with that uh, blue casein. I left one white. Um, and I uh, said to people that in an ideal world, I would under a color in a much more complicated landscape. So what me of what happens to the forest? It was called Lost Forest. It's part of the project called the Lost on Governor's Island, and you can see that and a lot of other stuff on my website. So the next rule is there will be critical disruptions. Sorry. Uh, in initial conditions. So the critical disruptions in this case were the people who entered the forest and they created these tree notes. 
by first uh, outlining the shape of a vertical sine wave, that's S-I-N-E, and then painting them in and having an experience with the forest that was really different than just walking through it. Uh, this one, I think the last one, I think both of these are in New York State. A lot of them were done in Virginia. There were about 250 done in Virginia and West Virginia. So um, during this time while I was working on these uh, tasks, I had cancer and it was traumatic and it was exhausting. And so I did a little artist book. Uh, this is the, the cover of that book about that experience. But I'm going to play you a little bit of um, the, the video documentation of the overture that we did for the Blue Tree Symphony. And you can see how hopeful and positive I was then. Let's, let's see if I can get this up to full screen. to play the whole thing for you because it's so small I think it, it's probably hard to follow but it is on my website so the next rule is that play will teach and this is from an installation at the perspective gallery in uh, Virginia Tech uh, where we had banners uh, alluding to some of the legal issues we had suspended branches and again we had immersive bird song in the space and this was intended to be meditative. This is a maquette for an installation that did not happen or has not happened yet, which would have been the site for an opera based on the project. And this is another maquette specifically for Governor's Island. We had hoped to do this project in uh, August of last year. And with the pandemic, of course, it didn't happen. So now we get to the actual trial. And in this image, the one that's being used for the marketing for uh, this event, this witness who was identified as Oxygenia Kelp was listening to this piece of a tree that actually was rescued from Virginia. And this is the judge, April Neubauer. She's a Bronx uh, Supreme Court judge. And she adjudicated that uh, there would be an injunction. Now, this was a mock trial. So the purpose of a mock trial is it's a rehearsal for the legal theory. The significance of getting that adjudication was that it could be the basis for case law in a real courtroom. And that is actually something that uh, some people are working on now for a piece of pipeline in New Orleans. And this is uh, Robin Scully, who did a tremendous amount of the painting and teamwork. Uh, this was the jury that uh, testified why there should be an injunction. And this is uh, just from an installation from uh, my studio time at Governor's Island. You see, I'm still working with the trees. This was a dance work. 
And now I'm going to read you the last excerpt from my book. And uh, this is from the introduction. Classical writers have described how the hills of Greece and Italy were once clothed in complex forest systems. Trees were cut down to build cities, leaving scant vegetation to knit soil and causing erosion that led to torrential floods. Increasingly, I see human expansionism as an ancient pattern driven by entitlement to extractive behaviors with impunity. The result is fragmentation. COVID-19 was today's red flag. But this is the breathless moment of promise in chaos a moment for us all to discover new answers to old questions like, how do we all get along? Our answers may help us all survive a desperate world that often scares me to death. This is when the future emerges. You can find a lot more information on my website. And I've uh, cut the talk a tiny bit short because I'm really interested in hearing your feedback, your thoughts, and your questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Aviva. Um, if you do have questions, please, um, you can either put them in the chat and I'd be more than happy to read them for you. Um, or you can raise your hand using the raise hand icon and I'll call on you and you can just uh, ask your question directly to Aviva. Uh... And I don't see any questions. Oh, but I do see that Marta Kern is here. Hi, Marta. <laughs> now I'm going to take a minute or two just to see. Hi, Hi. 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 And Lynn Elizabeth is here. She's my publisher. Oh, my goodness gracious. And Karen Frain is here. She's my cousin. And Mary Jo Agerstone, she's writing a book that I'm in. Oh my goodness gracious. And Susan Steinman, who is the source of inspiration for weed these days since Joe passed away. And, and gosh, Susan, you're, you're amazing. You're a legend. You're our Joan of Arc. And Sharon, oh, I'm, and I'm so pleased to see Hana Utamura and Beverly and Betsy and Christy. Christy's my neighbor in New York and Laggy. Oh my goodness, Jenny, uh, Rebecca, uh, I'm sure let everybody, Deanna, Tim, I'm so pleased you're here, Eliza, Stacy. I am thrilled beyond words. Christy, Nina, I love you all. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> Ask me some I, questions. I do, have, I do have a question now. It looks like Rebecca asks. Um, she's wondering more about the structuring of your symphony, specifically your notes. Maybe you just want to talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, so there were two problems that I tried to solve simultaneously. One was how to stop heavy equipment from going through the corridors where they wanted to put in the gas lines. And the other was how to manifest that as music. So uh, the first thing I did was I sketched out what kind of pattern I needed to create to impede the machinery. And then I looked at that pattern to see how it made a melody. Um, and then it was inflected from measure to measure. Each measure was one third mile long by the local topography uh, and vegetation. So for example, a high point might represent uh, additional chords or um, note embellishments. Um, and uh, the harmony was in the recapitulation of the iteration of the melody. 
Does that help? Fascinating. Yes. Um, I, I don't fully grasp it, but I can get I get an idea of how you came into organizing it. It was visual. It was basically um, looking at um, how do you stop passage and how once you've stopped packet uh, passage, how does that translate into how does that pattern? translate into music. And uh, Marta asked how trigger point theory might be scaled uh, for climate change challenges and the clouds. Um, my experience is that when I look at data uh, through the lens of the six rules that I identified, uh, insights do emerge about how to reorganize the elements. So the elements we need to reorganize include um, conserving water and habitat both um, marine and terrestrial. Um, I don't think these are, I don't think I can give you a simple answer like, um, Oh, if you apply trigger point theory, it'll shut up a whole bunch of idiots who are talking. Um, I wish. Um, it's a process and, a, and an approach to problem solving, which from which seems to be emerging some interesting answers to difficult questions. So the question in, um, the Blue Tree Symphony was, is it possible that the legal definition of eminent domain law is being uh, perverted by corporations because the original definition is uh, to protect the sacred home and to establish the common good. If this is about how we own property, then it's also about copyright. And so that was how right now with the firework I'm doing in the UK, I keep looking at the patterns in the mapping to see what, what's missing, what, what have we not looked at. Um, and we keep layering, we keep looking for the images, we keep looking for the metaphor, um, and we apply the rules of trigger point theory, we seem to be narrowing it down. For example, uh, the fires are not about tree cover of vegetation, apparently. They seem to be about uh, the chemistry of soils composition. And we can't get all the maps we need, but we are uh, zeroing in on some more interesting questions. Does, does that help answer, Marta? No, but that's no, okay. But I'll talk to you I'll later. <laughs> Good, I hope so. I hope so. Um, you say a bit more about how the six rules came into focus for you. Okay, so um, I think it was in hindsight. So I noticed what I was doing over and over and over again. I was playing with ideas. I was uh, playing with plants. I was playing with the wind. The wind became a really big part of that project, of the Ghost Nets project. Um, and I was noticing that when I worked that way, the habitat became more productive. There was more biodiversity. So, over time, I began to distill, well, what were the elements that I went to the site that uh, result in uh, healing the site or improving the site, or as I said, making the site more productive or more biodiverse. And so they were distilled from looking back on that process. Does that answer your question? Amara? Yes, yes, it does. I, okay. it, yeah. Um, and Susan, have you recorded the entire symphony? Oh, I've, I've done a lot of bits and pieces. 
Um, I really want to do an opera. Um, it's been a logistical nightmare. We did get some funding last summer and then uh, the pandemic happened and that just blew everything up. Uh, the people I was working with decided they didn't want to do this and they didn't want to do that. And so it just didn't happen. Um, and then I decided that I had to get the book done, the Divining Chaos book done first. And now that that's almost done, I'm trying to come back to the whole symphony, the whole opera. And I, I think that's gonna take me a couple of years. Um, did that answer your question, Susan? Basically, no. <laughs> well, I wish you would. Me too. I think it would be a fabulous, fabulous piece. You know, it would bring, um, I think, it, first of all, YouTube is like such a fabulous platform with so many people just randomly finding great things. And I think it's a way to disseminate the information in a very beautiful way. And, um, you know, just maybe by the amount of people who would watch it, it would be further evidence to bring into court for you. Who knows? Absolutely. Um, I did some classes at Juilliard in music theory, and I worked with a tutor there who uh, does some composition. What I'd really like to do is hire him, but then to hire him, I need to pay him. And I've been applying for grants like mad um, for a couple of years, and I just I can't get the funding, and I can't I can't pay for it on my own. Um, but it's it's on my mind, and I agree it would be pretty interesting. Uh, Mary Jo, there's been some legal increase in uh, recognition of the rights of nature. Yes. How do you plan to expand your work and expand supporting this progress? Talk a bit about your project, Stop Ecocide. Well, I think I've uh, approached this question the way I've approached everything for the past 20 or 30 years now, which is how do I apply the six rules of trigger point theory? So um, since I couldn't raise money for the opera, uh, I did the book. It was my next best task. Um, and I hope that the book will expand the conversation. I, I think it's critical to expand the conversation. And as you know, I'm doing this project with the State Department of Science, Art, Net Zero. And it's, it's gonna be a slow process. Uh, these are new ideas for them. Uh, there are uh, systems within the bureaucracy that we have to negotiate. They're, I think they're very interested and they're open. Um, it's all a push-pull. We all know this. It's a push-pull between how do you educate people? How do you change the laws? They change the laws by getting into a courtroom. To get into a courtroom, you have to have the lawyers who are willing to uh, take the risk of uh, being countersued for a frivolous lawsuit. They could be destroyed completely. They, their families uh, with dark money. Uh, it's much better this year than it was while we had the former administration in place because people aren't as totally terrified. Um, but I don't have a quick answer for this. Uh, so I'm doing my best and dancing as fast as I can. Uh, Beverly, when a campaign to save a force loses, it appears you're able to use that loss as material for more work and other. When the loss creates a huge danger to it and it does a grieving process. Yeah, oh, I, I think that's a, a wonderful point and a really important question. That was why when I showed the cut tree, it was so important to me to realize that was the beginning of the story, not the end. And the story is really simple. It's that we're doing awful things and we can call it ecocide, we can call it a lot of different things, but they're horrible. And there's um, human casualties and there's animal casualties 
either. I don't know a lot about how trees function. The devastation to forests is just unbelievable. It's, it's hard to encompass. Uh, so yeah, I think grief is a big part. Um, in my book, I've tried really hard to integrate my personal response to all of this and the data, the science and the theory. And a lot of what I feel is rage. I am just enraged a lot of the time. And that's hard to live with. Um, and I feel sorrow and I feel sadness and I feel incredible frustration. And, and, then, and then I have to go to the rule that uh, no matter how urgent things seem, it takes time and there is enough time because I'm not trying to do this myself. A lot of the world is trying to deal with this. Uh, Jenny, do you think this work has become more relevant to the I think it has. Um, it seems to me, and other people might see it differently, it seems to me that people are connecting more dots, for example, between racism and uh, capitalism and patriarchy and how those relationships as an agent in a complex adaptive system, how those end up with a predictable outcome, which is ecocide or the pandemic. I don't think people have totally put those pieces together, but I think they're beginning to get it and more and more people are talking about it. Um, copy of my book. The book is coming out next summer, 2022. Um, Lynn, start a waiting list. People are, are interested. <laughs> uh, Christy, can you talk a little about how you have developed your international presence in the echo art world? It seems wide and vast. Um, I guess I talk a lot. I guess I show up. Um, I guess I'm willing to argue with people. Um, the truth is that the echo art uh, world is extremely international. Just the echo art list includes over 200, I think, members at this point, all invited members from all over the world. And people have conferences, they have shows. And if you want to be part of the discussion, and that's how Eleanor Anton once put it to me, that uh, the reason we, we push forward with art is we want to be part of the conversation. Um, and so one thing just leads to another. So in one sense, it's very vast internationally. In another sense, it's a very small world. Um, it's a growing world. I would say there are uh, easily maybe 10,000 people working across the planet in some version of echo art, but there are a hell of a lot more painters, for example. So it's still pretty new. If you don't already know the book Paradigm Wars, Indigenous People. Oh, who... like... Yes, sorry. We have a live, we have a live hand. Um, Miss Jude Norris or Minok Brown. Oh! Oh, I love her. <laughs> she's here. Oh, she's here. I'm so thrilled. Yes. <laughs> Let Babakwe speak. Yeah, Babakwe. There we go. Sensei Aviva. Hi. Um, oh, I'm so happy you're here. So uh, glad to be here and see your work again in this context. Can you hear me? I can hear you very well, and I'm absolutely oh, thrilled that you're great. here. I think it is so, so often. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and you should you should explain to people how we know each other because you were working at the Native American House on Governor's Island last summer, and we became friends there. Yeah, we were both doing residencies on Pagank. Um, just wanted to say real quick, Kwinganau Walomwa Nindashimsi Loan. And um, Lena Poking. So we're on Lenape territory in New York. Oh, right I'm now. sorry we didn't do that. Um, yeah. So, so another thing. So I wanted to ask for just a slight adjustment in wording moving forward. 
uh, about the word humans in relation to environmental destruction, because we have hundreds of cultures here on Turtle Island who've had thousands upon thousands of years of history of living harmonically, pun intended, <laughs> with the land, <laughs> right? So it's not humans, it's, to, it's more about culture, right? So um, it's, what, you know, that it's a laudable thing. You are working to um, find ways to, from what I'm understanding, uh, imagine and create, you know, culture that does work with and not destructively in relationship to the land and the environment. Um, oh, my question is, uh, given that that's the work that you dedicated your life to, um, how, how, like in what ways you might see your work in relationship to uh, indigeneity when, when you're working on territories where we do have those histories, where we, where we do have cultures who uh, are already existing that have this, have, you know, very strong blueprints of being uh, environmentally um, kind and holistic. But obviously at the same time, we have varying levels, but often very extreme, usually very extreme damage to our cultures, but it doesn't mean those cultures aren't still here, but we are. So um, yeah, that's my question. Oh, well, do you want me to answer that standing on one foot or can I, do I have a little bit more? Um, these are incredibly important questions. Um, when I first started working on the Ghost Nuts project, I made a real effort to connect with local indigenous people and um, be guided by their wisdom. Um, you know me a little bit, so you know that uh, I've always been really interested in Native American cultures and tried to learn as humbly as I possibly could from all of you. I've been, I was very grateful for the teachings that you gave me, that you shared with me and for your comments today. Um, one of the things that's really interesting that's come out of the work on the FIRE project, which is uh, international systems, is it seems to be that, um, and this is also coming out of a series of seminars I'm doing, um, something called Forest Guardians about forest systems around the world. It seems to be that lands that are managed by indigenous people have escaped the worst fires. And we all know that there's a long tradition of thousands of years of fire management amongst indigenous people. And that, I mean, just that idea alone is extremely fascinating. Um, I try to credit, and um, I really feel badly that I didn't credit. I, I, I'm on the Wabanaki lands right now. Uh, in New York, it's Lenny Lenape. Um, but I think about that a lot. Um, the, the problem, as you know, is that just as women's voices are often silenced or ignored, um, that's even more true of Native American peoples. And it's a different kind of wisdom that uh, Native American people and indigenous peoples across the world can bring to these issues than, for example, the voices of people of color whether Latinx or black or, or whatever. Um, and I mean, I don't wanna go into a whole pol political digression about that, but I, I think it's an incredibly important problem. Um, and th that probably doesn't answer your question. Uh, I think the only thing I can say to your question is that I do my best to be mindful and I often fail um, but I still try. And um, I mean, there are people who devoted themselves, for example, to the work of Dennis Martinez, uh, white, white Anglo people, <coughs> who did a lot of work on fire management across the uh, Western United States. Um, 
I have not chosen to devote myself to uh, focusing exclusively on indigenous knowledge. Maybe that's a mistake, maybe I should. Um, it's something that I think about a lot and I probably have not answered your question at all, Vivankwe. Well, I appreciate your answer. And I also want to acknowledge you know, the, the complexity and that that's a, a very big question. Um, but I just, you know, I also feel like it's fundamental. Um, it but it's, it's complex and, and problematic, right? Because we're dealing with Western imposed systems here that are causing the problems. So, you know, another big question is, you know, can you apply indigenous knowledge to navigating Western systems? I don't know, you know, like, right? It's, com it's, it's complicated. So, yeah. Well, just take, for example, the six rules of trigger point theory. When I first started on the uh, ghost nets project, I was applying a lot of what I had learned from studying the medicine wheel. It took me several years to figure out how to separate um, attributing what I had learned about the Native American medicine wheel from the experience of inspiration that uh, tapped me into my own cultural wealth, for example, music theory, that I could bring to the concerns. These things are incredibly hard to tease apart. And you and I have talked about this, for example, Ward Churchill's writings that are uh, so strong against the participation of uh, Anglos in any aspect of these kinds of ideas. What Dennis Martinez used to say was, the goal is to marry traditional environmental knowledge with Western environmental knowledge. For me, that comes back to the rule about layering. We just have to keep layering as much as possible. But also the uh, way I did the diagram for the six rules of trigger point theory were completely inspired by the medicine wheel because what the medicine wheel taught me was to walk the quadrants of the land over and over and over again to gain deeper insight into what the land could teach me. Now, where precisely do I separate how I learned about that from Native American friends from what I brought of my own experience and education to the project is I, I think difficult. Yeah. And it does speak to the complexity that you referred to. Right, yeah. And also, you know, I appreciate you acknowledging, I mean, that's another issue, right? Is I, we've talked about this before. Like, I don't think that the answer is for non-Native people to be, you know, suddenly trying to be Native and, in our ceremonies or you know some places you know that happens some places it's not even allowed so it's it's complex for all of us and i just just wanted to you know open up the just acknowledgement and dialogue a little bit but not to take completely in that direction <laughs> from your talk and your project either but you know as an indigenous person listening to you know somebody wholeheartedly addressing these issues, but still we're on indigenous territories. It's like, you can't, but have that conversation some way, somehow, right? So totally conversation. One of the things that's kind of interesting for me um, about this question of how, how do I personally approach these questions and how have indigenous peoples approach these problems? And I don't remember whether you and I talked about this or not, but as somebody who's Jewish, my relationship to land is really different than yours for a lot of really, really complicated reasons. So one of the takeaways in a lot of my work is to some extent, even though I'm really concerned with the practical, how disembodied it is. Um, so, for example, the concept of the symphony 
is a disembodied systemic approach to the very real on the ground problems of how do you conserve ecotones and forest contiguity. In an ideal world, we might continue to learn from each other. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I mean, I feel like that disembodiment for, from where I'm sitting, I almost see it like, I don't know if the right, it's the right terminology, but it's like, you know, some, some what do they call it? An environmental activist, you know, on the ground groups that I've been involved with in the past, almost like akin to monkey wrenching or stop gap measures to like save areas of land that are in extreme danger right now in any, by any means possible where, you know, using creative measures, but ultimately, you know, the deeper, there's like these deep fundamental layers of culture that are really the issue of creating that damage in the first place, right? So. You know, one of the things I'm just going to, I want to monopolize uh, this particular question, but, um, oh, no, what was I going to say? I'm sorry, I've forgotten it. Um, uh, okay, maybe know, we'll go to another question. Emergency measures versus deeper cultural changes. That, is that? Gone with the wind. Oh, well. Uh, maybe <laughs> it'll come back. Aviva. <laughs> I just wanted to um, uh, just to pause kind of um, from your talk um, is that now we've been talking for uh, we've gone a little a little bit over 15 minutes over. Um, if you want to continue uh, talking about maybe finish up the last two questions and then we have a mixer afterwards um, for people to continue speaking about your work and um, I can have other members talk about um, just converse as well, if that's all right with you. <laughs> Certainly. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to talk about these ideas. Yeah, it's been amazing having you. I think we have, um, I think there's a question, let's see, a couple of questions back here, um, and then we'll kind of close out. Um, I think there was um, a question, let's see. Thank you all who have posted books and other information in the chat. I hope we can save that and share it with everybody. Aviva, can you say anything more about the soil? Uh, you were saying in the fire, yeah. what you're doing there, looking at the soil is being an influence? Really interesting. The, the modeler I'm working with, Olivia, commented when we first began our project that uh, the soils people aren't talking to the fire people. Um, so one of the things I can do as an artist is I can just go in and ask anything I want. So I started asking about the soils and the different composition. And one of the things we started looking at um, was, of course, the patterns of relationship between the soils and the fire and tent. And what we seem to be seeing, and we don't know this for sure yet, that um, the volcanic composition rock is more impervious to fire than other compositions. And there are a lot of questions there like, why uh, is it chemical? Um, volcanic material is very rich, um, but there is a disconnect between the uh, richness of the soil and the um, vegetative abundance. So we don't know all the answers, but this is a clue that seems to correlate more than anything else we've looked at so far. There's a more discussion going on in California about how the lack of salmon going up the rivers and the small tributaries into the mountains could be having an impact on the health of the forest because all those sea minerals aren't being brought into the highlands anymore. Good I'm point. curious about your, yeah, the work you're doing. Well, one of the things I learned through the work that Dennis was doing was about how um, 
Native American management of um, uh, riparian zones was really important to uh, manage temperatures in the water. And by managing the temperatures in the water, they could also manage the fisheries. Um, needless to say, nobody's doing this or very few people are doing it or it's lost in indigenous cultures that are being ignored. But that's a fascinating question. What exact, and in general, what fascinates me about indigenous cultural responses to ecosystem management is how perfectly it's integrated into the culture. So for example, the way the vegetation is managed uh, is because of basket weaving um, techniques. So they gather certain grasses like sweet grass or whatever um, at certain times of year. And that is a management protocol. But then those grasses are woven into these exquisite baskets. And I've spoken to indigenous basket makers who talk about um, the patterns were lost because so many people were lost, but they can dream the patterns back. And then those baskets are used to feed people and their rituals and dances and songs. I mean, the, the sheer richness of that approach to environmental engineering is completely overwhelming. Somebody asked, how do we get this to scale? Marta asked that. Well, I think we start paying attention to ideas like that about how everything is interconnected in really complicated ways. And that complexity is not something to be afraid of. It's something to embrace and be grateful for because it's what's gonna save our lives. Are there any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much, Aviva, for your time and for your thoughts and sharing your work and your research with all of us here. Um, I wanna thank everyone who joined and um, came to the talk today to hear Aviva Ramani. Um, please make sure to go visit her website. Um, I believe I linked it in the chat. Um, and obviously go buy her book when it comes out next summer. <laughs> Um, yep. something that she's been working pretty tirelessly, <laughs> tirelessly towards. Um, I want to thank everyone here um, for coming and um, joining us at Art and Activism. Um, if you enjoyed the content here today, please um, donate. Um, you can donate at weedartists.org um, as we are mostly a volunteer. <laughs> Um, organization, um, Women in Eco Art Artists Dialogue. Um, and I want to make sure that if you are not already to please become a member for WEED. Um, it's open to all um, artists and creators. Um, you can find more information um, on our website um, under the WEED membership tab. All right, thank you so much. We um, need, we need to have Mary board. make an announcement. Yes, yes, let's have Mary make an announcement, our board director. Hi, I'm Mary White. Thank you all for coming. We have two exhibits, which are, we have the call out for them and they're part of this very large um, extraction collaboration of over a hundred artists from around the world. So uh, we have one call, which is the call is due on June 1st, and the other call is due on July 1st, two local venues, in Gallery Route 1 in Marin County, and the P Peninsula Museum of Art, which currently has a show of Joe Hansen, one of our founders. So I hope that all of you will take a look at the call. Uh, it's called From Extraction to Restoration and Regeneration, part one and part two, the two shows. And we love, it's a member show. You can apply if you're not a member, but if you become a member, 
then you need to pay current dues. So we're looking forward to people um, sending in two-dimensional, three-dimensional work. We're very excited to have these uh, shows which relate specifically to the kind of work Aviva's doing. So thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Mary. Thank you everyone. Um, I'm going to pause the recording and then I'm going to start um, the recording again for our PostWorks mixer. Please stay if you like. Um, so I'm gonna start um, and this is just going to be mostly a free form um, talk. I encourage people, lead members or people who are just at Aviva's talk for art and activism um, to, to talk, raise questions, continue things that they wanna talk about. We'll also talk about if people want, um, talk about the calls for, um, for, for weed, uh, for extraction that um, we had just talked about. And if you have any questions about uploading or um, becoming a member, anything like that. Um, so I'm gonna kind of open the floor right now um, and I'll have Mary talk <laughs> first. <laughs> I, think I just want to uh, open the, the uh, mixer by reminding people that if you are interested in the calls for from extraction to restoration and regeneration art on the edge, then the call is on the website. So all you need to do is to go to the weed website and there it's a you know, application through entry thingy. Thank you. And I just put it in the chat. So if you just go for that, you can just go that right now and just apply. And um, yeah, we have lots of opportunities right now for, for artists. So take a break from your Zoom or whatever you're doing for most of the day and just do something for yourself and apply. <laughs> well, I just want to thank you all again. This has been an amazing conversation. I really appreciate it the thoughtful questions and how informed you all are. Um, it adds a lot to my research and to my thinking and my contemplation, which is all very selfish and self-centered, but I am extremely grateful for it. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Aviva. Yes, thank you, Aviva. I, this is Lynn, I, I'd like to um, thank Weed for an extraordinary uh, program series. Uh, it's so it's so so rich, and everyone that I attend, I think of more friends that I should have invited, and I'm embarrassed that I didn't, you know, think to invite them ahead of time. But I'll, I'm going to keep, put, you know, putting putting the word out again. Again, we're putting in our newsletter, but that's not enough. I need to personally invite certain friends. And Aviva, I, I thank you for um, just the most fascinating conversation. And, and of course, your you know, wonderful um, words about your book coming out. I also want to point out that, um, that you and Amara uh, and two other co-editors uh, have their book coming out, Eco Art in Action, in February. And I'm so thrilled that you know, the book is in layout right now and it, it, it's just super exciting. But what's ex particularly exciting are the contributions from 67 some artists from around the world. When I go to their individual websites, I mean, the material in the book is, is, is going to be a wonderful gift for the world. But when I even go to their websites and see more of their work, there's so much depth with each person. I'm, I'm really bowled over. Um, and so I just, I wanna also throw out a question, Aviva. I'm curious about the people who have influenced you. They may not be other eco artists, but I, I'm curious about the influences on your, your diverse interests. So um, I, turn it, I turn it back to you. Thank you. Um, the artist who influenced me the most, I'd have to say, was Robert Rauschenberg. 
And the way he influenced me the most was that I was in one of his performances at the Armory Show, the Nine Evenings Armory Show. And I was very young. I think I was 21, 20. And um, I just got it. I got how he put together technology, <coughs> ordinary people, and really um, big scale imagery. Um, and that was probably the most seminal experience I had with another artist. I have to say one of the things that I'm disappointed about in my own history is that it hasn't primarily been the women that inspired me. The women who have been close friends for whom I've been incredibly grateful, like Merle Eucles or Carolee Schneeman, uh, have certainly been people who um, inflected my ideas. But I would say that uh, it was that one experience with Robert Rauschenberg that set me on the course for the rest of my life. And it's in my book. <laughs> oh, and then like every young artist, Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> I'll add a comment if I can. Please. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Aviva, oh, I have known you for so long, since the late 1980s, and it has been a joy to watch um, your work mature and intensify, and at the same time, being narrowed down to this, you know, strong center that you have, that you bring to your work. And, um, you know, I can just remember, you know, sharing a group room with you and you practicing your um, music singing early in the morning and go like, what the heck is she doing that for? You know, <laughs> now I know and I can be more appreciative. And, um, and you and Joe Hansen and I did one, Eco art panels at um, the um, uh, the C. What is it? what are the initials? I don't know. The uh, College Art Association in 1998, I think. And I just feel like so much good work has sprung forward from that. But your work in particular has just gathered up such depth, depth and clarity. I applaud you for it. I'm done. <laughs> I have a question. Um, this is for both Babankwe and if I'm saying that correctly, um, and Aviva, which is as you guys were talking, um, I started wondering about like actually where are the overlaps between the progress we're making in indigenous land law and um, uh, indigenous rights at this time with the um, corporate law and eminent domain and copyright angle that Aviva is going. And um, uh, something that triggered this thought was like just this uh, afternoon, I was reading that here in the state where I am in Washington on Coast Salish traditional land, uh, the tribes just won a suit to require the state to not just consult with tribes, but to actually receive the consent of tribes in when they're making a policy that would affect, you know, climate change and, and climate issues, um, which is a, you know, pretty major step forward uh, for our part of the country. I don't, I'm not even that aware about how other parts of the country are going. Um, either of you want to comment, comment about those overlaps? Maybe it's too big a question. <laughs> 
I do want to say one thing about that, <clears throat> since I am local mm -hmm. to this <laughs> issue, is that mm -hmm. um, this has been established and it's encouraging, mm -hmm. but the governor um, and local politicians in Tacoma are not paying attention to anything um, the Puyallup tribe has requested. Right. And mm -hmm. the you know treaty has been violated thousands of times. And most recently, there was a huge loss because the refinery that's been built in the port of Tacoma on Puyallup land mm -hmm. is um, a great danger, not only to the whole city of Tacoma, but to the fishing rights that were fought for for you know many decades and um the tribe is concerned now that salmon will no longer be running in a year or so on the puyallup river and this when the salmon go the tribe mm -hmm. sees itself as no longer functioning as a tribe so this is what's new about this announcement today. And I absolutely, I have no question about like the, you know, that's so true what you've been saying um, because up until now, uh, the state has only needed to quote unquote, confer with the, you know, confer with the tribe or, but not to actually, this law apparently requires consent which um, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming would actually make a big difference in how much voice the Puyallup have for that. I, I, you know, I, it, I, don't, I hope it's not too late, but. And I just say a couple of things. First of all, I really, really want to thank Susan. Uh, what mm -hmm. you said really moved me tremendously, really did. Um, it, it, it's different when you've known a colleague and a friend for a long time and they pay attention to how you've mm -hmm. evolved. And thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. About this idea of consent, it, it sounds really promising. Yeah, I think about this all the time, like, oh, I was talking to my therapist about it last week. It was like, I try so hard and we still are in this horrible situation. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm not the only one who's trying so hard. Um, yeah, I try to look at it somewhat philosophically, like, well, Joan of Arc was burned at the stake, but she did accomplish something first. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, and, and this is the part about my rule of there's time to change, yeah, but what about all the collateral damage? What about the salmon? What about the tribes? What about the land? Um, it drives me crazy. Late at night, I get really depressed about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear you. And I wanted to um, just jump on what Beverly was saying, because I was thinking in a very similar train of thought mm -hmm. to what in relation to what Beverly said is like, yeah, that's great that those laws have been implemented. It's definitely better than them not being put in place. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, I'm thinking, but is it, is it really gonna stop that from happening? Probably not right. that easily because, and I was thinking about this yet again the other day, you know, the things we think about, right? It's like, Mm -hmm. I think about these relationships between these disparate cultures constantly mm -hmm. because you can never, never turn your face away from it. As mm -hmm. an indigenous person, you, you mm -hmm. can't ever, not for one minute, right? Except right. watching TV or doing escape, unhealthy escapism activities, you know? So I was thinking about laws and lawmaking and relationship between law and how people, general public, respond to law. Because mm -hmm. I mean, I live in Brooklyn where I'm constantly dealing with just to what from my cultural vantage point is just like rampant disrespect, which mm -hmm. basically amounts to um, quality of life, you know, it impacts your quality of life. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking, well, there, there's laws in place for most of these things, some of them not because some of them aren't even acknowledged as how, you know, how does the vibration of a car stereo affect a human body, you know, it's like 
priorities culturally are really different too. But I was thinking like, you know, it's the people who are, who, you know, there was laws made, people are trying to uphold the treaty laws all the time too, mm -hmm. right? Those, right. you know, every single reservation has had land, well, I, I don't quote me, but most reservations have had land, large pieces of land, stolen or abused or like what Beverly just described you know corporations coming in and doing stuff that they've got no right to do were those laws ever up were the treaty laws upheld no people are fighting <laughs> right like, like mm -hmm. and then even within like non-native environments or predominantly you know people where it's areas where it's predominant well the whole turtle island is now predominantly non-native but you know do people uphold the laws no Mm -hmm. because it's not embedded in the culture mm -hmm. until it until it's embedded in the culture to treat each other and the land until that's just how you roll mm -hmm. uh, th from my perspective we're mm -hmm. pretty screwed mm -hmm. right like right. <laughs> mm -hmm. so the question is how then it comes back to what we were talking about earlier because it's like well should we should people be trying to like reinvent or invent new culture on lands where there's thousands of years of history of holistic culture but mm -hmm. then we have this issue of mistrust <laughs> right mm -hmm. right not, not a small issue mm -hmm. like so to even communicate in ways where we can have enough trust to actually and and then even even ideal situation okay we have enough trust to actually can talk about really talk about culture because that comes down to ceremony and things that you know we don't generally share mm -hmm. you know I still don't think the answer is for westerners to become native so I, I'm very interested in people um non-native people in the so-called Americas really tracing back to where the dysfunctionality and abusiveness in those cultures started from because I think a lot of cultures actually started off a lot healthier than they've ended up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's my from that's just from my own reading and perspective. And I'm not saying all, and I I know it's dangerous to generalize, and I'm no, not an expert. Mm -hmm. But when I have delved into that, both intellectually and intuitively, mm -hmm. that's because you know our cultures come from spirit. Right. And I'm, I'm like, if your culture doesn't come from spirit, you're going to stay like missing the point and knowing how to be like, I don't think you can understand how to be in relationship with the earth mm -hmm. from your mind, mm -hmm. right? Like that can't be the leader. Mm -hmm. So that's my two cents. You hmm. could take, you could take that even one step further. You can't be in relationship with each other even, which is really oh, central. Right? To us, it's, it's all the same, mm -hmm. right? I'm just using the word land, but it's all the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pick up on um, something that came up earlier about where does the legal part come in? Um, Nancy Prinzenthal did a book last year about uh, art about violence against women, especially a lot on rape. And towards the end of her book, she used the word impunity. And this has really stuck in my head um, that uh, the reason people get away with ecocide is because they can, there's mm -hmm. impunity. Mm -hmm. um, so where do people, I mean, it's something that I remember thinking about, about the Nazis when I was a little girl, when I was like 11 years old, I wrote an essay about it that the reason it happened was because people felt they had permission. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. have permission, you have impunity. So one of the legal issues for me is mm -hmm. we've got to nail these corporations and put them in jail for ecocide. Mm -hmm. The source of the word ecocide is genocide. Bankwe, mm -hmm. you know better than Oh, you're cutting out. You 
you cutting out a little it's bit? Totally cutting out. Or you're like the accountability. And my personal. What? Aviva, you could try turning off your, your the video and just speaking. And maybe we'll, we can hear you. Um, all I said was that. Oh, now you're good. Sorry. Now you're muted. <laughs> Where'd she go? Just Sorry. on the table again. Sorry about that. It was simply um, <laughs> hammering away at this idea that uh, you can have ecocide and rape and all the and all the other things you have, as long as people have permission to behave with impunity, and it is past time from a legal point of view, and this goes to earth justice and environmental justice and uh, native rights and a whole lot of other things. It's past due for people to be held accountable for ecocide. The source of the term ecocide is genocide. And there that is no accident. And people have to be held accountable. So um, I, I happen to think there's a big connection between the patterns that result in ecocide and patriarchy. Um, other people have other opinions, but um, from what I know of Native American cultures, they are not patriarchal. From what I know of Anglo cultures, they're ridiculously patriarchal. That has to be assaulted. That has to be dismantled. Yeah, I agree. Along with white supremacy, that's key. Right. Well, white but, supremacy But it is comes from that. It comes from this imbalance. Right? But we're talking to uh, a, a group of, you know, eco-feminist artist types, right? So we're, we're preaching to the converted here, I think. But yeah. Yeah, that's the thing where we're scared. I think I feel so Well, that cut out. All I said was, I think we are inspiring each other. And that's important. Because uh, when I feel depressed late at night about we're not making the kind of progress I'd like to see, it's because I start thinking that I have to do it by myself. And when I hear everybody today, expressing feelings that resonate for me, it's heartening and it, it makes it easier for me to carry on and to encourage everybody else. Definitely need support systems. I'm so glad I got to be your friend, Bibakwe. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> and we've, we've been, yeah, I've been completely off the radar. So it's nice to talk and see your face. Likewise, and I'm so grateful for everybody else here who I count as my friends, some of them, some of you new friends, some of you old friends, but it's quite wonderful to have a party. <laughs> yeah, I love this idea of like the after talk talk. That's, that's cool. Yeah, I think it's a great opportunity to just like let people actually have a voice or be able to freeform chat. And I'm thankful to you, Bonkwe, and for Aviva for staying. I wasn't expecting you to stay for so long. So I'm really happy about that. Um, I guess I did have like one question. Um, the way that, have you seen any other projects that have used copyright law, you think like successfully to to deter like more like gas lines or um, like, oil lines or things like that? Or have you seen anything, like anyone take on your work like with blue trees and then take it to another level or? Eliza um, Evans, I'm just checking to see whether she's still here. Um, yeah. Eliza, she's not. <coughs> Eliza so, yeah. Evans um, did initiate a project about using air rights to protect the mm. land. And I can't speak to it in detail, so I apologize. 
I think it's kind of on the radar um, because so many artists are interested in uh, systems change. And the minute you talk about the environment and systems change, you're immediately into the law. Um, right. So I can't say that I know of anybody who's tried to riff off what I've done. Um, but I think a lot of people are looking at the law as one more element of an art strategy. Yeah, can you, um, can you say the name of the woman that you were talking about before? Eliza, what was her last name? Eliza Evans. Evans, okay. See if I can reach out to her. Yeah. And she was on most of the talk, I think. Okay. I'll circle back on that. I'm going to say goodbye because my I'm getting, my battery is about to die. I just got the, the beeping noise. <laughs> So thank you, Aviva, thank again you for the talk. Us. Good yeah. work, and it's good to meet everybody. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi. Nice to have you with us. Yeah, we'll talk soon. Yeah. Yeah. Good plan. Okay. Take care, everybody. Thank you. you too. Bye. There's there is the the gentleman who's the hour is late, and my my mind is not calling his name who who did the copyright of the surface of his property to stop starts with the t peter von thank you He's I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry what oh, peter von tiesenhausen <laughs> copyrighted the top six inches of the right. soil on his ranch the problem was that he intimidated the gas companies, but it was never tested in the court system. But it certainly inspired me and the people who first contacted me to look into it as a strategy. Was he claiming that that was an art project in some way or? Uh -huh. Yes, he claimed, he claimed that his, I think it was in 1994, um, or, I'm not sure of the dates, sorry. Um, he claimed that his entire ranch was a work of art. He was a sculptor. Mm -hmm. He claimed the top six inches for copyright. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then he told the gas people that they could come talk to him for $100 an hour. I think it was $100, it might've been more. 500, 500. <laughs> So they were so cheap that they didn't want to talk to him. They one just went away. One of the uh, contributors to the Echo Art and Action book actually discusses uh, his work, uh, Jenny Brown, in, in her uh, provocation on Allodoxia. So mm -hmm. pretty interesting. Well, the part that interested me was how do you get it into the effing court room? Well, that still has to happen, right? I mean, you had the mock trial, but it- Nobody has gotten it into the a courtroom yet. Right, right. The reason, right. the reason is because right now, dark mm -hmm. money is intimidating the legal system, the lawyers, the activist lawyers. Activist law is specifically the idea that you win whether you win or lose <laughs> simply by ha having the conversation. Mm -hmm. and so I think artists are in a better position actually to do that than lawyers. Right. Everybody presumes we're crazy and they all know that we're wild cards. <laughs> but, lawyers, but lawyers can be held accountable and their whole careers can be destroyed um, in a different way than they would go after an artist. That heroic lawyer who won the suit for uh, payments from Chevron to right. indigenous people in Ecuador, he's still under house arrest. Wow. Mm. Yeah, and I've heard about deaths in Colombia um, that are really horrendous. Not to mention all the deaths in the Amazon. Right. 
Well, thank you, Aviva and Weed. I'm going to have to sign off and tend to my family. So <laughs> thank I'm you for coming, Amara. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Thank you so much, Amara. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. So you've got the hardcore weedsters left here. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's really been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much again for being willing to engage. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's really been an honor mm. and a delight. Mm. Wow. And your energy has held out. <laughs> it has, but I have to admit it's beginning to flag. <laughs> <laughs> As well it should. <laughs> well. But I regarded this as a really important opportunity mm -hmm. um, for a lot of different reasons. First of all, I think the whole series is really important that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Second of all, um, alluding back to what Susan said about me, I have watched how weed has developed. And this seems very much a, a efflorescence of um, the best of uh, where we started in 1999 and, and, um, and what uh, Joe had in mind as well and, and what we envisioned for the Echo Dialogue. I have to say that I do think that in some ways weed is being way more successful than the Echo Art Dialogue simply because, and now I remember what I was going to say before, simply because it's driven by women. Mm -hmm. um, what I was going to say before was that back in the 70s, one of the issues that we all discussed was what was going to happen to the women's colleges. The premise until that point was that women could get stronger in an all female community. And I get why men want to go to Vassar, but I think it's been at the expense of women. And uh, that can be as polemical as anybody wants, but that's my opinion. Um, I think you have been able to do this series because they're not men. Mm. Mm. And I believe that is your strength. And I remember very vividly Roy Staub particularly ranted for, for years about how he was entitled to be included. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm very glad that you held your, your place about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that history because gender is a conversation that's happening right now. Are you thinking of uh, letting men in? No, not, not at all. We're, we're discussing um, no. uh, gender non-binary and non-conforming people and how that fits in with the what has been up till now pretty much a male-female binary, um, the way I understand it. Well, a few months ago, Deanna, you'll remember, mm -hmm. I got lot of flack on the echo art dialogue because mm -hmm. I said echo feminism is not the same as intersectionality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there are still very specific ideas that emerge from echo feminism that should not be mushed up with every other ism that anybody can think of mm -hmm. doesn't mean that all these other isms aren't important Mm -hmm. But it's another way to shut women the F up. Mm -hmm. And it always happens in every, historically, every political movement. There comes a point where women are in the forefront. And then somebody says, oh, yeah, but we have these bigger issues than the women. And the women are shut up. And it's a kind of gaslighting, an historical gaslighting. And it perpetuates exactly the impunity that I'm railing against. Mm -hmm. And God knows I've got plenty of male friends and I work with plenty of men, but there is something unique 
that women can contribute and men don't help that. Mm -hmm. Even when they're well-meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have our own power and we are better together. <laughs> um, I'm just going to interject one thing right here. I think there's a, I think there's maybe a few people like Leah, maybe Verby or Rebecca, if they have any questions, I'm going to kind of wrap up the um, Postworks talk mixer, because um, it seems like it's just a couple board members and Aviva left. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just if you have any questions right now is the time. And I'm gonna start stop recording. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't have any. I'm gonna thank you so so much. This has been great. And I'm gonna just mm -hmm. uh, go check in on the website. So thank you. Okay, sounds great, Leah. All right. um, Bye. Hope to see you soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Are you raising Bye. your hand. <laughs>